You may be seated. Thank you for being here this morning. Really glad you're here. Let me just uh, quickly get us into the sermon today. Appreciate Daniel uh, hosting and leading. I want you to know this about Daniel. He's 49 years old today. Give him a hand, would you? And uh, so Daniel's almost one year from now, he'll be old like the rest of us. And uh, things go downhill, Daniel, rapidly. And uh, really glad you're here. And I appreciate his sensitivity about what's happening. And I don't want to repeat all of that. You, you've heard it. But um, there's no such thing as too much prayer, is there? So let's, uh, let's pray together as we get started. Father, I thank you for just the spirit of um, expectation that seems to permeate what's happening on campus, um, in our church, and in, in all of our ministries. And we are reminded more and more how much we need you. We look at world conditions. We look at what's happening, even as, as was mentioned about the, the hurricane bearing down on the Gulf Coast states. And Lord, there's so much that are, that's out of our control. And that should remind us that there's so little under our control. And we submit ourselves to you. We, we, we do as the Old Testament people did in the day of trouble. We lift up our eyes and look unto you and we keep our eyes fixed on you because we know that you are our hope. If that is true about the geopolitical world, if it's true about the natural world and, and the natural disasters, it's true about every detail and element of our lives. And we think about our people today, people part of our church family, loss of loved ones, dealing with sickness, COVID-related issues. Lord, some people just going through difficult times. I pray the empowering, encouraging, enabling work of the Holy Spirit of God through the word today would lift up Jesus and we would not see him as a solution, but as the solution to all that we're looking for and all that we need. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bibles, if you will, the Gospel of Matthew. We're in a series, we've entitled the series, Window into Heaven. Today, we're gonna to talk about the parable of the talent and uh, investing. What does it mean to invest in the kingdom? We, when we use these, these parables, we've said it's, it's using uh, earthly stories to convey heavenly meaning. In other words, a lot about what we know in eternity, what's going to be the future of the kingdom of God, we learn by what happens here on this earth. And there's a connection, a, 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 a relationship, if you will, an illustration of what is going to happen in eternity. When Jesus told stories, think Jesus was a master teacher. I promise you, some of you look at your watch when I get up to start teaching and uh, you think he's got probably about 10 or 12 minutes and he can hold my attention. And then, you know, it's all downhill after that. If Jesus was teaching, every one of us would be on the edge of our seats. And we'd be absolutely riveted in everything that Jesus said. And partly, partly because obviously he was the embodiment of truth, right? but also partly because he was skilled about how to illustrate truth and make it memorable to us. Jesus wants you to remember what his word says and he wants you to integrate it into your life on a day-by-day -day basis. But then these are also parables that give us a glimpse into the kingdom of heaven. And, and while we've defined that, I think today the point is this, that what happens here on this earth is in a very specific way connected to what is gonna happen in eternity. In fact, let me tell you, say it to you this way. How you live your life today, you'll feel the impact on how you will experience eternity. So we're gonna look at Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 24 and 25 are part of what we know to be the Olivet Discourse. Lisa and I were in Israel several years ago and when you go up on the Mount of Olives and you look down on the city of Jerusalem, it's one of the most breathtaking sights in all of Israel. And you realize that one day Jesus himself is going to literally 
step onto, his feet are gonna land on the Mount of Olives, second coming of Jesus Christ. And the Mount of Olives, the, the mountain is gonna divide in two, is gonna be absolutely um, the greatest moment in all of history. If you've ever stood there and looked down on Jerusalem, you, could, you, you can feel the, the empathy and ethos of the teaching of Jesus as he talked about his second coming. Chapter 24 describes the signs and the seasons, the time of Jesus coming. Chapter 25 is a series of parables. There's the parable of the 10 virgins. That's designed to teach you about the urgency of the Lord's coming. And then at the end, there's the parable of the goats and the sheep. That's about the importance of the Lord's coming, right? You don't wanna be a goat, you wanna be a sheep. The middle parable is a parable that we're gonna talk about today, and that teaches us how to prepare for the coming of the Lord. It is found in the parable of the talents. If you were to define this, this is in the outline we handed out in preparation for today, the big idea is we've been called to invest our lives in God's kingdom work. Now, I, I could say that to you a lot of ways and I wanna get this point across to you. How you live today matters for eternity. You can live for things today that may seem uh, to be important. They may feel a sense of urgency about them, but in light of eternity, you're actually living for things that do not matter at all. This is the story of the parable of the talents, Matthew 25, beginning in verse number 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. Underline the word his own servants and then his goods. And, he, unto, and unto one he gave five talents, let me say this to you very, very much up front because I want you to get this. These are not the talent to play the piano. This is not the talent to hit a golf ball. This is not the talent to sing. This is not the talent to, to preach. This is not you know, the, 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 the talent to draw pictures. It's not talent, that's not what he's talking about. He's actually using these talents as a metaphor and the talents here are a measure of currency or if you will, it's, it's money. It's literally money that is measured by weight. So one gets, and we could use $5, $2 and $1. We could use $5,000, $2,000, $1,000. It doesn't matter, $5 million, $2 million, and one. It doesn't matter. It's just each get a, dis, a, a proportioned amount, not an equal amount, a different amount. And unto the one he gave five talents, another two and another one. Every man according to his several ability and straightway took his journey. Let me say this to you. Not everybody gets the same equal opportunity in life. You say, wait a minute, that's not fair. Well, tough. That's not where you want it to be fair. Where you want it to be fair is how you're judged. You find out at the end that the Lord is actually more than fair in the way that he judges, right? And you better be careful what you wish for because what we're gonna learn is the more opportunity you have, the greater the accountability. Do you get that? the more opportunity, the greater the accountability. So equity and fairness does come into play. It comes into play because the Lord is always fair. Verse number 16, then he that received the five talents went and traded with the same and made other five talents. And likewise, he that received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. Underline that word reckon. 
It's a Southern word. So we know that the Bible is for Southerners, right? Maybe more than Northerners and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I've gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. I mean, that's just such an amazing thought. Hey, you've done good with what I gave you. Look at what I'm gonna reward you with. That's what Jesus said. I'm gonna reward you far more than you deserve. He also that received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I've gained two other talents besides them. And his Lord said unto him, well done, good and faithful servant that has been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Same reward as the guy that did five and five, right? Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man. Right in the margin of your Bible, excuse maker reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth and lo, thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said to him, thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest, you knew better. You're accountable for what you know. That I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him that hath ten talents, for unto every one that hath shall be given, and he, that shall have, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, this parable really can be disconcerting. And, and I'm gonna give you the secret to interpreting the parable, okay? And, and I said this, I, I spoke in the nine o'clock classic service this morning, and I said to them what I, exactly what I'm about to say to you. One of the things I love about our church and one thing that you have to absolutely remember, if you're new to a church, I want you to write this down and remember it. It matters whether you have a works-based view of the Bible or a grace-based view of the Bible. If you look at this parable through the lens of a works-based view, you get the idea, hey, the guys that did good go to heaven and the guy that doesn't do good goes to hell. He gets cast into outer darkness. That's not what the parable teaches. The parable is actually teaching this. People who have recognized and responded to the grace of God in their life live differently than people that don't respond and have not received the grace of God in their life. Do you get that? It's a matter of grace. And so in a grace-based view of this parable, you begin to understand if you invest your life in the kingdom of God, you're gonna be given more. In a grace-based view of this passage, if you waste your life, what you have will be taken away from you. Write this down somewhere. Stop wasting your life. Do you get it? Invest your life in the kingdom of God. The requirement of kingdom investing. Now, let me, let me try to unpack this story. I want you to really stay with me for a moment. I mean, I promise you, I've got an appointment this afternoon at 3.45. I've got to be out of here a few minutes before that, but we're going to get this thing done. The story is centered on a man who has servants. He calls these servants to himself prior to going on a journey. And he gives to these servants talents according to their ability. They don't all receive the same number or the same weight of talent, 
the talents are given by the man who knows his servants. Actually, if you understand this, if you trust the master, the master knows what you can handle. The master knows what your capacity are, your capabilities are. And so he gives to one five talents, he gives to another two talents, he gives to another one talent. Now, in each of those scenarios or cases, right, the talents belong to the Lord. They belong to the master. They're not the servant's talents, right? You you gotta gotta get this. Everything in your life is a byproduct of God's grace to you. Everything. And by the way, with God's grace should come an overwhelming sense of responsibility and accountability. The more you have, the more you're responsible for, the more accountable you become. So the talents are money that are calculated by weight, they're valuable, and there's an expectation that these valued talents given to the servants are going to be handled carefully. After a long time, the Lord returns and he reckons or takes account of his servants. These servants knew by their action that they were to make good use of the resources or the talents that were entrusted to them. In other words, they knew that there was an expectation. It was a built-in expectation that to whom much is given, much shall be required. I want you to stop for a moment and think about this. Think about all the opportunities, think about all the platform, think about all the giftedness that God has given to you, including where you are born, whom you are born to, where God placed you in the world as far as geographically and the freedom that you have to be exposed to the gospel. Think about the churches that you've been in. Think about your parents, think about your school, think about all the opportunities your career, your education. Think about everything that's been given to you and and stop for a moment and, and ask yourself this question. Am I treating those as a God given gift that I am to invest in the kingdom of God? Or am I wasting my life? The talent is not money. Let me define the talents in your outline. The talent is the opportunity and calling of your life in Christ. Every single person here is given an opportunity to invest their life in the work of the kingdom of God. And how you invest your life, what you do with what God has given to you is going to matter in eternity. Let let me explain it to you quickly. Again, you can follow along in your outline. Your life belongs to God. See, you say, well, wait a minute. I'm not a servant and I don't have a master. If you're a Christian, Jesus is your master. That's what we call lordship. And your life is not your own. You're bought with a price, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. And God's gift to you is a life that is full of kingdom investing, difference making, eternity worthy opportunity. Everybody's life is that. Your life belongs to God. Secondly, your life is uniquely designed and equipped. Just look at, look at the person sitting next to you and think to yourself, boy, I'm glad I'm not them. And think about how different you are from them. I I, I use this, just a quick illustration. My, my oldest brother who, who I have, have, you know, I mean, look, truthfully, my mom and dad had one phenomenally gifted son, me, and then they have, I have these three brothers that are just, you know, whatever. It just, just didn't happen for them like it happened for me. 
I'm just kidding, right? My oldest brother is a neurochemist. He's dean of school of pharmacy at the University of Toledo. He is, he's brilliant. I'm not saying that because he's my brother. I'm telling you, he's brilliant. Well, at least, let me tell you this. He comes across as brilliant because there's lots of times I'm in conversation with him. I have no earthly idea what he's saying. Now, either Tommy, I'm really, really, really ignorant or he's really, really smart. And, and this is important. His life matters to God as much as my life matters to God. And he is taking his unique design, his unique abilities, the, the unique giftedness that God has given to him, and he's using those to do what God has gifted and made him to do, just like I'm using the giftedness that God has given me. So I'm not saying today that, hey, you have to end up in full-time Christian service or you have to pastor a church. That's not the point of the parable. The point of the parable is God made you and whatever he made you and gifted you with should be used and invested in the kingdom of God. Now, let me tell you something. Recently, I've had several conversations with my brother about how, how to process through this whole COVID mess that we're in and about the safety of vaccines and, and uh, who should be vaccinated, who shouldn't be vaccinated. And I told him, I said, hey, I said, let me, let me tell you something. I said, you run some really weird people sometimes in church with some really weird and crazy ideas. I didn't want him to think bad about Southerners. He said, hey, he said, Tom, let me tell you something. There's really weird people with really weird ideas in academia too. I, I, I thought to myself, I knew it. I knew they were way weirder than we are. And he, he, and he explained from a very scientific, logical, we talked through it. And I was, I, was, I, was, I was impressed and grateful for his ability. And then we shifted our conversation. He wanted to know about church. And I wanted to know what was going on in his life. And, and because I know he's a Christian and I know that he serves the Lord, I said, well, tell me about your church. He goes to a large church in, in the Toledo area, multi-campus church. Now here's a guy, I mean, I'm telling you, he's, I mean, when I say he's brilliant, that, I mean, I, I, when I say that, I'm not exaggerating. He, he finished college when he was 20 years old. He had enough, he, he walked in and, and you know what a club test is? He took, he took all the club tests they would allow him to take and he went into college as a junior because he knew, he knew all the subject matter in the first two years of college. Got a perfect score on his SAT. I mean, his SAT score and my SAT score combined, right, would put us in the top 90% of the smartest people in the world. You know what he does on, on, on weekends? And, and, and this is, I mean, you talk about God's grace, Daniel. He's the most socially awkward person you'd ever meet in your life. And he's, he's, he passes out bulletins and he's on the hospitality team at the church that he goes to. You say, why? Because he wants to make his life count, right? And it counts what he does with the giftedness that he gets and it counts with the opportunities that he has, right? You see that? And, and your unique giftedness comes with a responsibility for you to invest in the kingdom of God. So then finally, your, your life is valuable and worthy of investment. There's an expectation, right? There is an expectation, a requirement from the master that you take what he's given you and you invest your life in the kingdom of God. Let me tell you a quick story. I may not get any further than this. I, and if I don't, that's fine. John Piper has become incredibly influential in the evangelical movement. I don't want to overstate that, but I want you to understand John Piper's an unusual person. And I'm not saying this because I, I'm, I'm, I'm not comparing myself to John Piper, but John Piper is one of these guys, if you were going to do a, a young adult and a youth conference, John Piper would not be the classic guy you would invite to speak at a young adult youth conference kind of thing. It'd be like me. We have, we've had youth conferences here. Nobody ever asked me to speak in a youth conference. 
I mean, I just, I mean, they, in fact, they don't, sometimes they don't even tell me that we're having them. You know, they just kind of want me to stay away from them. I'm, I'm not the kind of guy, you know, you don't think of teenagers cool and pastor. It just doesn't, you know, it's not a thing. And I get that. I understand. Now, I appreciate our teenagers, and I think our teenagers learn how to love the Bible and, 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 and want to know it and hear it and, and, and understand it. But, but my point is, Piper would be more like me. He, he, he would not be the kind of classic guy. In 2000, they, had, they were having their fourth Passion Conference. Passion Conferences are, are these large conferences. Louis Giglio is at the, the forefront of it. And, um, you know, the passion music and, and the kind of just these huge, massive gatherings of people. And Piper had become a regular speaker at these conferences. In 2000, he preached what is called his famous seashell sermon. To hear Piper describe it is really fascinating. He, 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 was, he preaches off notes and he had his set of notes and as he finished a, a, a page of notes, he would turn the page over and so he had a, a pile on the left-hand side and a pile of notes on the right-hand side. He was preaching outdoors. This is mass crowd of people estimated to be above 30,000, okay? The wind is blowing and blows Piper's notes away. He panics, looks down, realizes the notes that have been blown away are the notes that I've already covered. So he puts his hand down on the notes that he's preaching from and, and goes into Mark one hand preaching, which is just hard to do. If, you, if you're a two-handed preacher, you need two hands to preach, okay? And he's preaching one-handed with his hands on his notes. And he's telling this illustration. And, and he says, three weeks ago, we got news at our church, Bethlehem Baptist in Minneapolis, that Ruby Eliason and Laura Edwards were killed in the Cameroon. Now, people that describe this say that, that there was such an anointing on, and you can Google or YouTube the sermon, it's very powerful. And people said that this, this kind of this settledness came on the crowd as, as Piper started this point of the illustration. Ruby Eliason was over 80 years old, single all of her life and a nurse. She had poured out her life for one thing, to make Jesus Christ known among the sick and poor in the hardest and most unreached places in the world. Laura Edwards was a medical doctor in the Twin Cities. When she came to retirement, she partnered up with Ruby and they went from village to village in Cameroon, sharing the gospel with the poor and the forgotten and the disenfranchised. They were driving in a truck along a road, alongside a narrow road on a cliff. And they came to the corner and the brakes failed. And that truck with those two nearly 80 year old ladies who went over the cliff down, made impact, and instantly killed Laura Edwards and Ruby Eliason. Now, Piper's telling this story at a Passions Conference, and he said, last week when I told our church, he said, I asked them this question, is this a tragedy? And he answered the question by saying, and our church responded out loud by saying, no. No. So Piper looks at these 30,000 plus young people and he says to them, is this a tragedy? Giving them an opportunity to answer. And they say, instantly they call out, no. And Piper goes, you're right, it's not a tragedy. He said, let me read you what a tragedy is. And he pulls out this little illustration that he'd gotten from a Reader's Digest. He said, Bob and Penny took early retirement from their jobs in the Northeast five years ago. She was, he was 59, she was 51. They live now in Punta Gorda, Florida, where they cruise on their 30-foot boat, they play softball with their friends, and they collect seashells. He goes, that's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. And he said, and I get 40 minutes to plead with you, don't buy it. And companies are buying airtime and spending millions of dollars to convince you that your life doesn't matter unless you get to live out that dream. He said, I'm pleading with you. 
don't buy that dream. Because at the end, at the last chapter, before you stand before the creator of the universe to give an account with what you did, he said, all you're going to have is here, Lord, here's my seashell collection. Don't waste your life. Don't give your life away for nothing. And then he finished with this quote from C.T. Studd, who was a missionary. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. You have an opportunity with your life. Don't waste it. Secondly, very quickly, the accountability for kingdom investment. So if you, if you unpack this story, if the Lord is going to come back and reckon with his servant, literally, he, he is going to take out the books and he's going to add up what you did and he's going to take you into account for what you accomplish with your life. That means that you're going to give an answer to God for what you do with your time, what you do with your treasure, what you do with your talent, and beyond that, what you do to steward over every single opportunity that God has given to you. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, listen, I want you to know this. I, I'm not making this up. I, I'm not, I'm not embellishing the story. It just simply says the master gave them talents and then he went away and he comes back and he says, let's reckon. Here's the implication. I want you to get this. I want you to listen to me very carefully. That as a servant of Jesus Christ, you're under his authority. In other words, you don't determine what you do with the talents. You don't do, determine what you do with the opportunity. And you don't determine what you do with your life. See, here, here, let me tell you. We, we, here, here's the, here's the, the 2021 idea version of Christianity. If church fits into my schedule, I'm going to, I'll, I'll go. If it's convenient... Or if we can afford it, I'll tithe. Serve, are you crazy? You want more than one hour of my life in a week? Wait a minute, can I tell you something? W way more significant than you being under my authority you're under the authority of the one that gave you the five, the two, and the one talent. Now you can come and ask me what I think God wants you to do with that, but you better find out what you think he wants you to do with that. You take your instructions from him. You say, where do we get it? From the word of God. That also means that you're going to give account for your life work. Romans 14, verse, 10, verse 12. So then every one of us will shall give account of himself to God. 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. At the judgment seat of Christ, you're gonna answer for your work. Everything about your motive, everything about your time, everything about your treasure, everything about your talent is gonna be put to the trial of the fire of God in your life and only that which is enduring, eternal in nature will survive. Let me tell you something. You're accountable for your life. I'm accountable for my life. You gotta take that accountability seriously. Don't waste your life. Now that leads us to this final thought. I'll give it to you quickly and I'll be done. The blessing of kingdom investment. See, you know, we talk about this a lot. We, we talk about the fact that God wants us to be faithful. In 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 2, the Bible says, moreover is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. I think it actually goes beyond that. It's not just that God wants you to be faithful 
but he wants you to embrace the expectation of fruitfulness. In other words, anybody with a talent that they fail to use, they forfeit. Anyone that they, that with a talent that they use will grow and develop. I, I said this last week and some of you were here and heard it and some of you weren't here and needed to hear it and go back and listen to it. Remember uh, in, in the illustration about C.S. Lewis, your future glory self. God, do, listen, the version of you that's sitting on the chair today, the version of you that lives your life for yourself, the version of you that calls your own shots and determines what you're gonna do with your life, that's not the version of you that God's interested in. He's interested in the future glory self version of you where your life is taken over by Jesus Christ Christ and he becomes Lord of your life and you take your life and you invest it off the platforms and with the resources and giftedness that God has given to you and you make a difference for eternity. Listen, we need to get past this thing that God's called us just to faithfulness. God's called us to a life of fruitfulness. And secondly, we share in the riches of the kingdom. Now, I want to say this because I don't want you to miss this. When, when you look at this, I know it's a hard thing for, and, 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 and parables are metaphors, and this is an extended metaphor. And, and a, a metaphor is not, not necessarily intended. It, 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 it will always support biblical doctrine. It's not intended to be the basis for doctrine, okay? In, in this parable, you have two guys that enter into the joy of the Lord, and, and Jesus said, you've been faithful over a little and you're gonna be placed over much. You're actually gonna have rulership over much. So in the kingdom of God, people that take the opportunity to their life, the great reward is in, in, the, in the coming millennial kingdom, you will rule and reign with Jesus. You'll be given more responsibility and you will serve God based on how you lived your life here on this earth. You don't get in because of what you do you're rewarded for what you do. But what about the guy that doesn't? Well, here's the problem. He never received God's grace to begin with, right? So literally, he wastes his life. It's all about him. It's all about his life. You know, a few few weeks ago, Bobby Bowden passed away. Bobby Bowden was 91 years old. Because of the success of our high school football program, I have had the privilege, and and the coach is one of my closest friends, I've had the privilege of meeting some of the greatest college football coaches living. Uh, And he's called me many times and said, hey, so-and-so's on campus. I met Nick Saban. I, and and the, the fascinating guy. Intense as can be. I mean, he, he, he can't stop talking football. I mean, he's just intense. I've, I've met most of the coaches that have coached at the University of Florida. I've met um, coaches that coach at the University of Georgia. Kirby Smart, Mark Rick. I know Dabo Sweeney, the coach at Clemson. Probably nobody's been more fascinating of character in the last... 40 to 50 years in college football than Bobby Bowden. And when I came to Jacksonville, Bobby Bowden was at the height of, or at the very beginning of the height of, of his popularity as a coach at Florida State University. And, and they, they set a number of records and it had, it had a tremendously successful career. In fact, he's the second winnest, winningest major uh, conference football coach in, in history. Okay, so there's no question he's been successful. What what has come out about Bowden over the last several weeks was known to people that were close to him. Was he was he was not just a dedicated Christian. He was a he was a deeply committed soul winner. Story goes back to 1986 and 87. He had a kid that played for him by the name of Pablo Lopez. And you got to realize 1987 was the start of what is called the Bowden dynasty. 14 years in a row, top five finishes in, in the AP poll. 1987, Pablo Lopez is killed. It, it bothers Bowden deeply. 
he calls for a team meeting, asks all the players to come. They have assigned seats in their meeting room and purposefully he did it that way so that Pablo Lopez's seat would be empty. Now here's Bowden. He's got kids from every imaginable walk of life all over the country that are playing football for him. They all come from different kind of backgrounds, different kind of churches, different, and, and they're all sitting there in that room and Bowden points out Pablo's chair and he says, Pablo was killed last night and today his, his seat, his chair is empty. He said, you want me to tell you what bothers me the most about that? He said, I don't know where he, Pablo's going to spend eternity. He said, I just don't know. He said, I can't do anything about it. He said, but I can do something about where you're going to spend eternity. And he shared the gospel. I mean, he, he took the Bible and, and shared the gospel and told the story of Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And he said, if any of you aren't a Christian and you want to be a Christian, if you just come and talk to me, he said, I will show you, I will help you, I will lead you to Christ. The next day, I'm going to flip stories a little bit. Mark Rick, who, who for years was on Bowden's staff up to 2000, then he went to coach at the University of Georgia, and then he went and coached at the University of Miami, and now he's a broadcaster with ESPN. Mark Rick, highly successful. He said, I was so convicted. He said, I knew the minute Coach Bowden started talking and when he said, some of you don't know where you're gonna spend eternity, Mark Rick said, oh, I knew where I was gonna spend eternity and it wasn't heaven. He said, I got up the next morning. He said, I was the second one to the office. Bowden was the only one that was there before me. I knocked on Coach Bowden's door. He looked up at me and he said, Mark, what can I do for you? He said, I walked in and he said, Coach, I know that if I died right now, I wouldn't go to heaven and I want to do, I want to do something about it. And, and Bobby, Mark Rick said, Bobby Bowden took his Bible and in his office, he led me to Christ. Now, now let me tell you something. That story can be repeated over and over and over and over again. At Bowden's funeral, Bowden's pastor got up and said that in the latter years of his life, from the time he was 80 to he was 91, that he, he, he would stop by the church and he said to the pastor, he said, pastor, I don't wanna waste my life. He said, if you can find a place, he said, I don't care if it's five people or 5,000 people, if you can find a place where you can use me to give my testimony and if God can use whatever platform I have to tell people about Jesus, he said, I don't care if they, I, I, he said, I don't need money. I, I'm, not, I'm not looking for a recognition. I just want God to use every day of my life. I don't want to waste my life. At his funeral, Please listen to me. Just stay with me for just a minute because I want some of you to really hear this. His son got up and, and said that with permission, he was sharing something that was deeply personal to the family. In 2004, Bobby Bowden's son-in-law and grandson were killed in an accident. It didn't get a lot of coverage because it, it, it was reported, but there wasn't a lot of coverage about it. The family was very private. His family shared at the funeral that that week, and it was, a, it was a, a Miami week, so Florida State was playing Miami that week. That week they had the funeral, then they had the Miami game. And while the family went to the funeral and were grieving, and then they went to the Miami game together because that was what the family did. When they got to the Miami game, every family member got a letter, every family, part of his family, got a letter from, from Bobby Bowden. That's what Bobby Bowden said. This is 2004. He would have been about 74 years old at the time. He said, God has given me more opportunities in life to accomplish more things than I would have ever dreamed. He said, none of this, not, not, not any win, not any championship, not any trophy, not any ring means anything at all. He said, the only thing that matters to your mother and me is this. We want to know that all of us are going to be together in heaven for eternity. 
That's the only thing that matters. He said, anything else in life doesn't really matter at all. And he said, I'm writing you today to tell you what it takes, what it means for you to be a Christian. And I don't want you to think that you're going to be, that you're a Christian because your mom and your dad or because the family you're born into, that you're, it's a personal decision. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And every single one of you have to make that choice. That is the most important thing in the world to me. Now look, if you said to me, what's the most important thing in my life? The most important thing in my life is that my wife and my four children and their spouses and their kids know Jesus Christ as their personal savior. And anything I do beyond that doesn't really matter. Do you understand that? You know what matters to me? Will you listen to me for a minute? What matters to me is that you know Jesus Christ as your personal savior. I, I, don't, I don't care how much money you make. I don't care how little money you make. I don't care what kind of job you have. I, 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 I don't care about that. I, I, but I do care about this is where you're gonna spend eternity. And beyond that, you know what matters to me? Is what you do with your life. Because one day, we're all gonna stand before God. Every single one of us. And we are gonna do, as this story tells us, we're gonna give account. God is, Mark, God is gonna reckon with us over what we did with the life that he gave us to lead. Let me say this to you again. Don't waste your life. Don't put Jesus on the list of things you're gonna do. Put him at the center of everything in your life. Let's bow our heads, stand with me if you would. I want you to listen to me for a moment. I'm gonna give you an opportunity. Some of you, you're not sure you're a Christian. And, and I did not preach this to make you feel guilty or cause you to be concerned. I, want, I preach this to give you an opportunity to call on Jesus as your Savior. Maybe you'd say, Pastor, I'm not saved, but I want to be. Would you, would you do this with me? I'm gonna pray a simple prayer. It's not the prayer that saves you, it's, it's calling on Jesus. Believe in your heart that, that He is the only hope that you have for salvation. I'm gonna say a prayer out loud. I want you to say it quietly in your seat. If you're not a Christian and you want to be, you can pray this prayer just like this. Dear Lord, I know today that I have an emptiness in my life, that I have put myself at the center of my life and as a result of that, I've excluded you. And whether I like to admit it or not, I, I've been working to save myself by what I do. Today, I really want my life to count. I see that, that you gave Jesus as a gift to me I believe in what he did for me on the cross and I receive him into my heart and life as my Lord and Savior. Help me to live for you in Jesus' name. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you'd say, Pastor, I prayed that today and I'm not ashamed to let you know that and I'm not ashamed to make that public. I just want you to pray for me in your closing prayer. I'm not going to embarrass you or call you by name or come to where you're sitting, but I will pray for you by name. Just lift that hand up high. I, I ask Jesus to come into my life today as my Lord and Savior. And I just want you to know that. And I want God to know it. Would you just slip that hand up high, high enough for me to see it, long enough for me to recognize it. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. And God bless you and you and you. Somebody else, just lift that hand up high, high enough for me to see it long enough for me to recognize it. Here's what I want you to do. Everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed. You raise your hand, just look at me real quick for a moment. Just, I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm gonna make it as easy as I can. Pastor Paul's over here to my left. Pastor Daniel's over here to my right. If you would just go to one of them and everybody else's heads are bowed and eyes closed, you can come right now. You don't even have to wait. You can come right now. Just go to them and say, I prayed that prayer and I want somebody to talk with me 
and I want somebody to help me understand better what it means to be a follower, just come right now. That's God bless you. Somebody else, just, just you prayed, you asked the Lord to come into your life, just follow up on that next step and, and come right now and let, let here, come see Pastor Daniel right over here. And somebody will, will get somebody to talk with you. Somebody else, if, if you prayed that and you know, you know you need to follow up on that, I want you to come and just come, come quietly here. We have other workers that'll help you. You don't have to wait for them. Just, just come right now. Now listen to me, I want you to listen to me. Dads, listen to me. Don't waste your life. Do not waste your life. Live in a way that your kids know what matters to you. Take responsibility to lead your family spiritually. To live in a way that they know that the great priority of your life is to take what God has given to you and you're gonna sow it. You're gonna invest it in the kingdom of God. That's what matters. That's what matters more to them. Don't waste your life. Moms, listen to me. You have more influence over your kids than anybody else. God's put you in their life to be a gospel witness. God's put you in, your, in their life for you to help them to know Jesus with their life. And, and it matters how you live. It matters the choices that you make. Mom and dad live in a way that when your kids look back on their life, they know that serving Jesus Christ was a priority to you. That it mattered. That it was something that you gave your life to. Listen to me, young people. You, you, listen, listen to me. And I want you to really get this. It can be confusing and difficult and lonely. And, and, and you, I mean, trying to process, what do I do with my life? What did God really gift me for? What is the next step for me? Is, are there things that I, I should be doing with my life? Let me tell you something. If you'll just submit yourself, if you just say to Jesus today, I'm not sure what it is that you want me to do, but I'm willing, I'm surrendered my life. I'm willing to take the, my hands off my life and do whatever you want me to do. I'm telling you, that's, that, is the, that is the next step for you. And I promise you, with all my heart, God will reveal to you what he wants you to do with your life. If you say, God, I surrender everything I have to you, God will show you. In a moment, when Mark leads the saying, if, if you got, this altar is a place to surrender. Some of you could just do good, just come say, God, I gotta rearrange some things. In my life. I don't wanna waste my life any, any longer. I don't wanna take a chance on wasting my life. Lord, speak to our hearts. Help us to see that living for you really, really matters. Help us not to waste our lives.